Everybody, good morning and please be seated. Welcome to Church Our Saviour. My name is Pastor Daniel and we want to welcome you if you are joining us for the very first time. This is uh, our communion service. It's a family service and you know we have all the different generations worshipping together. Now, it's been such an exciting week for all of us. You know, uh, this uh, last week we've seen uh, our young adults uh, dialogue. Uh, some of our young adults had a gap retreat over at Changi Cove. A lot of things have been happening. We actually had a spa for women, I'm not sure how many of you actually came, but you did, did come, you know, I hope you remember the, uh, the lights, the decoration, and of course the smells, you can smell it from the whole church. You know, a lot of things happened in this past week. Last week, we saw the baptism of uh, a number of our young people, I think six or seven of our youths, and then in uh, Sunday, we also seen uh, over nearly 20 of our adults being baptized. So we thank God for that because they are taking their first step you know, into the faith as uh, becoming part of the family of God. And then, we also want to thank all of you parents who have been enduring the, you know, the renovations going up at 308 and, you know, your children had to go to level 4 instead of your usual level 3. Because of all these things happening, I'm very happy to tell you that uh, renovations of 308 is now done with, all right? And uh, the, the new hall is beautiful. I wish I had uh, put up a photo for you, but the new hall is actually called Galilee Room, okay? So if you want to go to Galilee, just make your way up to uh, Room 308 and you can see it's completely different. It looks like a chapel now. And the reason we are doing this is because, you know, one, we wanted to have uh, the best possible facility for your children. We'll make sure that their experience in church is a very good one. You know, we want it to be clean. And so please go up there, take a look uh, after the kids are cleared up from it. But we also, because of this new place, were able to do new things with it. In fact, the whole of yesterday was uh, one of our Alpha Holy Spirit weekends that was ran from early morning in room 308. And guess what? Three people came to Christ. We're very, very glad to see that happen. Two days ago, uh, our Chinese Alpha had another four people come to Christ. And during the week, several of the parents of our family uh, members also came to Christ. Pastor Chris actually baptized one of them in the hospital. God is really doing a lot of things. And you know, my, my feeling is always that I don't want any of you to miss out on this, you know, because God is not just doing it for other people, God has something for you also. Amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God has something for you. Okay, He does have something for us. We just finished uh, the season, the Hebrew season of Passover, and uh, last week, last on the 23rd of, uh, of January, February, March, April, or 23rd of April, it was time is passing so fast, we're already in May, right? But on the 23rd of April was the Hebrew Passover, which is a little bit different in counting from the Easter, but because, you know, uh, historically, Good Friday and uh, Passover should coincide. But over the years, because they counted in slightly different ways, uh, we had the uh, Easter earlier and uh, uh, Good Friday earlier. This year, it's a little bit separated from Passover. So 23rd of April was the Hebrew counting of the Passover. And you know in the Bible, this is one of the concentration of the, what we call the Feast of the Lord, right? The Bible institutes for us what is uh, seven of these celebrations, if you like, seven feasts that we are told to observe, right? The children of Israel are told to observe. Uh, these are the Feast of the Passover, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then after that you have the Feast of uh, Sukkot, the Feast of, uh, uh, the Feast of the Trumpets, what we call the Day of Trumpets, and of course Yom Kippur, right? Day of Atonement. These are the different feasts that we are all supposed to remember because there is some special significance in it, things that God wants us not just to remember for ourselves, but as parents to teach to our children. So all of you who are parents here, you know, you have a certain responsibility. The Bible calls upon you to make sure that your children understands what the Lord has done. So we just came from that whole conglomeration, right, of Passover, and then on Easter Sunday, there's the Feast of the First Fruits, and then starting from Passover, there's this seven days known as the Unleavened Bread. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today, but before we jump into that, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how all this came about, how all this Exodus story came about. So today we are looking at the book of Exodus, right? And the story of Exodus really begins in Exodus chapter 2 when a new pharaoh, a new king comes into power. You remember, some of you will remember that Joseph had gained a lot of favour with the pharaoh. And because of this, you know, Abraham and uh, their whole tribe were able to prosper in the land of Egypt. They multiplied and they multiplied. And then a new pharaoh, a new king comes along and everything changes. I mean, sometimes that happens in our modern world today when uh, you know, political leadership changes, then suddenly you know, everything changes. 
And this is the case in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. We read, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. This is the kings that knew Joseph. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning. And God remembered His covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. You know, they were in a very difficult situation, like many of us sometimes find ourselves in. And they cried out to God, and here's the first good thing we know, that God hears our prayers. God hears our cries. God even hears your groanings. And I might add, God even hears your complaints. God hears us. You know, and I think Singaporeans, this is good because we like to complain. And you know that God is listening, right? In fact, in the book of, I think it's Malachi, that it writes that a book is written for all the things that you say. When you get to heaven, God is going to show you all your complaints, you know. Because full out, see this list and that list and that list, and you complain a lot, right? But God hears it. And now, God is about to answer their prayer. In fact, He's going to answer it in an unprecedented way. He's going to do it supernaturally. Sometimes we forget that God does these things. You know, today we are living in a world where we're very busy with life. We're doing all our level best to get on with life peacefully and well. And we forget that God sometimes intervenes. He steps in our story and He does things that just blows our mind and reveals that He is present. This is what He's about to do. In your misery, the children of Israel, they called out and God remembers His covenant promise. That's the other thing. God not only hears, He remembers. He remembers that He's made a promise and He keeps that promise. I'm always very encouraged because, you know, we are about 3,000-something years, 3,400 years from the, the things that we're reading about now. That's a long time. And yet, we know that today, God keeps His promises just as He did all those thousands of years ago. I find it very heartening, you know, especially when I see God doing amazing things. And does God, you know, for instance, the, the reformulation of the state of Israel, we all gave up on Israel. It was no longer a country. But God remembers His promise. And in the fullness of time, right, in the course of time, in the process of time, it says here, God steps in and He fulfills His promises. Not always according to our timetable, but according to His timetable. And then we see that Moses being chosen as this somewhat reluctant servant, right? Moses didn't want to go along, but God told him, Moses, you're the guy. So he goes to Pharaoh to confront Pharaoh and to demand the release of the Hebrew people. Unfortunately, the Pharaoh was not too keen on this idea. Think about it, right? You're being asked to release all of your servants, all of your slaves that they have enjoyed for a little while. So Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? Okay, in other words, capital L O R D, who is Yehovah or Yeh Yahweh? that I should obey his voice and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord. I do not know this Jehovah, this God of yours. I do not know him. And I will not, nor will I let Israel go. So he wasn't too crazy about the idea. Uh, but as it turns out, he wasn't the only one who was not keen on the Israel, uh, children of Israel leaving uh, Egypt. Because Moses not only spoke to the Pharaoh, he also spoke to the children of Israel, right? Came to the, the people, the Hebrew people, and said, guys, listen, God is about to do something. And we read that in Exodus chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. And he's speaking the words of God. And I will bring you into the land which I saw to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God speaking to these people through Moses. I will give it to you as a, as a heritage. I am the Lord. In the Bible, whenever you see this phrase, I am the Lord, very often you see it like in a connection to some commandments that God gives. That is like God's signature, right? Ani Yehovah. That's, it's like, you know, at the end of the, some document, you put your signature there. That's kind of how God does it. In the Bible, whenever He puts that, these are the words that God Himself spoke, right? And God is saying to them, listen, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to bring you into a land of promise. I'm going to keep my promises. You will receive this heritage now you would think that they will be elated. Yes, finally, we're going to get our own land. We'll be happy. But you read on, it says here, So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Wow, that's interesting, right? God is saying that, listen, I, I heard you. 
You want to get out of this place? I'm going to bring you out. But they did not heed Moses. They did not believe him. They were cynical, right? They were skeptical because of anguish of spirit. You know, sometimes in our lives, we can be so caught up in our struggles that we just fail to recognize when God is trying to help us. You know, I mean, we can be so depressed, and there's some people struggling with depression. You can be so depressed, looking so much inward to your problems that you fail to recognize when something good is coming your way, and thus you're not able to receive it. And maybe for some of us, this is our situation here today. In fact, the Hebrew word that's translated anguish of spirit, uh, it's actually not anguish, right? The Hebrew word actually says you're short of spirit. You're short of spirit. In other words, you are, you're out of spirit. You're out of hope. There's no fight left in you. And perhaps today, there are some Christians here who might be near that point. You've been struggling. You've been fighting. You're doing all, your, all that you can to, to deal with a situation in your life. And you're so down. And God is wanting to speak into your life. But you are, oh, no, 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 I cannot be. I, I, I just I, I got to do this thing, right? And I want to suggest to you that sometimes you need to pause. You need to pause in your struggle and to open the door so that the Holy Spirit, that God can intervene into your situation. can step into your situation to do something amazing for you. Can you say amen? Right? So you will remember this because sometimes we forget these things. Well, they, well, they kind of were not keen on it. Right? They were not keen on this promise or maybe they couldn't believe. They were afraid that if I, if I allow myself to hope, what if I get disappointed again? You're right? So they, they told Moses, no, just leave us alone. So this, uh, this led to, of course, uh, what now we call the ten plagues, right? the ten plagues that uh, fell upon Egypt. These ten plagues, uh, you know, God already knew that Pharaoh would be stubborn. Right? He knew that because in Exodus chapter 6, verse 1, God provided a hint to Moses as to how it would end. He said to him, the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Now at that point, Moses did not know, right? He did not know. He was just doing whatever God told him to do step by step. For with a strong hand, he, that is Pharaoh, will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of this land. Now this was before the, the plague started. But God already knew how it would end. That's also another reminder to us of God's sovereignty. You don't know how things will turn out. You do not know how the markets will perform tomorrow. You do not know how the economy will turn out for this nation. You do not know how your business will be. In fact, you don't even know how your life will go this coming week. But you know what? God knows the end from the beginning. He already knows how it's all going to end. And I think that's very comforting. Many times I jump into a bus. I don't necessarily know which turn it's going to, uh, the driver is going to take. But you know, as long as I'm on the right bus, I know where it's going to end up. Right? And that's what many of us need to do. You don't need to understand everything. You don't need to have a revelation of every detail of the. You just need to have a revelation of who it is that's holding your hand. You know, that's a song that we used to sing. I know who holds my hand, right? And I hope that today you can know that the one who holds your hands is trustworthy, is faithful, he keeps his promises, and he hears your prayer. So here in uh, here in the, uh, in Exodus six, Moses is being given a hint. Okay, this is how it's going to go. So anyway, we get to this. Plague starting, uh, well, basically starting from chapter 6, 7 onwards. And God performs these miracles. Actually, some of these, uh, these plagues are almost comical. When it starts out, it was you know, relatively mild, right? The, the water of the Nile turns to the blood. That's really inconvenient. But you, know, you can find water from wells and from elsewhere. It's not too bad. And then you get frogs. Well, I mean, if Chinese, they'll be happy, right? Because we, we, they eat frogs. But, you know, I, I guess the uh, Egyptians don't eat frogs, but they had this infestation of frogs. And then lice, you know, L-I-C-E, lice, and f flies. And this was just an inconvenient stuff, right? Oh, all these flies everywhere. I remember when I went to uh, Australia, you know, I, I went to the middle of Australia in the desert, and there was just flies everywhere in summer. You open your mouth, you eat. I was climbing some um, hill, and I probably ate a few flies on the way up, right? I didn't die. It was inconvenient, but I didn't quite die from it. And I guess some of these things were just almost comically inconvenient. But each of these plagues, one was worse than the other one, right? Each one was escalating in intensity. And I think 
why 10 plagues? Why not just go straight to number 10? I think it's because God wanted to give Pharaoh a chance to relent. It's giving me a chance. Okay, we're going to scale this up. You know, those of you who are parents, you know how it is like sometimes you're negotiating with a kid, you know, and say, say sorry. No. Okay, we're going to have to up the ante a little bit here. If you don't say sorry, you know, you're not going to be able to play so and so and watch your TV tonight. No. Okay, well, not only that, tomorrow you cannot go. You know, you just up it a little bit because you want them to come to a realization of what is right. And I think this was God's mercy on Pharaoh and on Egypt really giving them not just one, but ten chances to turn from their wicked ways so that God may uh, perform His wills without doing all these things. I imagine that if God is doing some, now, some of you here in your life, okay, let's, now, I don't want to say, but you think about yourself. Maybe God is doing the same thing in our lives. I, I sometimes feel like God is doing this in my life. You know, when certain things happen in my life, I wonder, is this a plague, you know, in my life? It's a mini plague in your life. It's God trying to correct me. And if He is, I don't want to wait until the 10th plague. I mean, look, the sign of the very first plague, I'm done. Yes, Lord, I'm turning. You follow what I'm saying? So maybe in your lives today, you need to be asking, uh, plague number, what are you at? Now, with some of you, maybe God is doing something. I'm sure in the room like this, God is trying to correct some of us. God is trying to drop hints to you. Maybe God is causing certain things in your life to happen. Listen, the smart thing to do is turn back really quick, right? Repent really quickly. Don't wait until it gets to the 10th plague. At that point, man, you'll be crying. You'll be in miserable condition. And sometimes he does that because there was no other way, right? So if he's talking to you in an easy way, doesn't work, well, then it's going to come up to the heart discipline. God is merciful. We see that in the 10th plagues. Why not five? Why not two? Why not just one? Because God gives us many chances to turn back to Him. And I know that for some of you here today, God is calling you to turn back from certain things and He's giving you an opportunity. He's not making it hard. He's not revealing it. He's not exposing it. But He's saying, hey, why don't you turn back? When you hear that, turn back. Exodus chapter 12, we see finally they get to the last of the plagues. Now many of you will be very familiar with this story, how you know, on that particular night, God was going to deliver them. He was going to prepare them all to leave Egypt. He gave them some very specific instructions relating to that last meal that we call the Passover meal. Or in Hebrew, we call it the Pesach, right? The Passover meal, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details. You probably should know it. If you don't, you can read Exodus chapter 12. Now, many of us will remember how this angel of death came on Passover, right? On the night of the Passover, the angel of death came and as he came to each house, he'll look upon the lintel of the house, the doorpost of the house, and if he sees the blood of the lamb, what does the angel do? It passes over. Doesn't look in the house, you know. Doesn't see how many people in the house. Did they all pay their ticket? No, didn't check, right? Doesn't look in the house to see, is this a good guy or bad guy? Was he popular or not, you know? Doesn't. Looks only at the blood of the lamb. That's actually a amazing act of grace. And what did the people have to do? Actually, nothing. They just needed to put the blood, not their own blood, but the blood of the Lamb. And they just had to receive it. It was an act of God's merciful sparing, a deliverance for them. Of course, this, oh, by the way, this reminds me, by the way, whenever I think of the Passover, I remind, I'm reminded of how, you know, some 40 years ago, it used to be in uh, Singapore and actually uh, in ma many of the places in Southeast Asia that Chinese homes would have a red cloth that's hung uh, over the door. I I'm not sure if we still see... I, I don't seem to see that much today. It seems to be out of fashion. But back in the day, this was very common. You know, actually in China, you see people hang a red cloth over there. I always wondered, what is this red cloth about? When I was very young, I thought someone got married. But cannot be so many people getting married all the time. So this... As it turns out, it's something to, it's luck to ward off evil, so to speak. So I got really curious and started looking at the background of this, you know. Turns out this goes back a very, very long time in China. And nobody really knows where it comes from. I have my suspicions. I suspect that they probably got this from Jews who went over a long time ago. And maybe it could be even a Hebraic root tradition, right? And that people are saying, this is what protects us. 
in the same way that the blood of the Lamb protects us. So it's something that Chinese should understand, right? Chinese especially, you should understand this very well. The, the, that thing alone is what the angel of death looks at and passes over every house. Now this is the first of the feast, the feast of the Passover. And that's how we get to this point. Up to that point, the, the deliverance is done purely by God. You only have to follow the instructions. God comes and He goes and He does it. But then, at this point, a second feast in the Old Testament is instituted. And this is known as the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. So we read that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. It says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall remove leaven from your houses. All right? That's the first day. You've got to remove all the leaven. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day. So this is a seven-day feast. All right? Passover is how many days? One day. This here is a seven days, a long feast. That person shall be cut off from Israel. Very serious. I mean, it's almost covenantal. Once you break this, man, you are out. You're not one of the, the people of Israel. On the first day, there shall, there shall be a holy convocation, a great meeting. And on the seventh day, there shall also be a holy convocation for you. So two days, you'll meet together. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this same day, I will have brought you your armies out of the land of Egypt. Side note, I didn't know they had armies, right? But it says armies, I think it's the word sevaot, probably means host. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. So you shall always remember this every year, not just that one year, but every year thereafter, you shall remember that. And we will talk about why. In the first month of the 14th day of the month at evening, actually the same day as Passover, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven shall be found in your houses since anyone, whoever eats what is leaven? That same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leaven. In all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. It's quite repetitive, right? I think maybe in case, just in case you didn't know what kind of bread is talking about, unleavened bread, right? Okay, so this is really interesting. Uh, for seven days, now in modern day Israel, you kind of think about how do they keep this. Think about this for a second. Uh, and do you know what's okay? I'm not sure. How many of you know what's leaven? This is not leaves, huh? Because when I was young, I didn't know what's leaven. It sounds like looks like leaves, right? Maybe type someone put a N instead of S, right? Okay, for those of you who don't know, leaven is what today we call yeast. In fact, the Bible actually uses two words, seor and chametz. One is yeast and one is the product of yeast. Right? Both of these are translated for us just as the word leaven. So what is leaven? Leaven for those of you who bake is yeast. So when you bake, you have to prepare some dough, right? That's what you, where your bread comes from. But in order to make the dough rise, right, you have to add leaven. This leaven, this yeast, is a kind of fungus. It's a microorganism that will consume the sugars in the dough. So your dough has some kind of sugar inside, you know, the flour. It will consume the sugar. And when after it consumes the sugar, it produces carbon dioxide. So all these bubbles will start to appear in your dough. That's what actually causes the dough. After a while, it just rises all by itself, right? Now, when you bake this uh, leavened bread that has risen, your bread will become very fluffy and soft. That's why when you tear your bread apart, it, it looks like there are many bubbles inside, right? That bubbles is the carbon dioxide that the leaven, the yeast produces. Now, if you didn't leaven the bread, then what you basically have is... Probably none, you know, none, you know, the Indian bread or, or some kind of prata kind of thing. It doesn't rise up because there's no leaven. Now, the process of leavening today is relatively fast. You go to NTUC, you buy lab, baking yeast, you throw it inside. After a couple of hours, it will have risen, right? You kind of, um, kind of work it into your dough. But back in those days, there wasn't NTUC in Egypt, right? There's no cold storage in Egypt. So where do they get their leaven from? So the way they would do it is they would take some old bread or old dough, right? Sometimes we call it sour dough. This old dough, they'll use this because there's already some leaven inside. They'll work it into the new dough so that the leaven will sort of like grow and then begins to cause this new batch of dough to rise. Now this process is considerably slower. 
It easily takes 12 hours or even longer, even a full day to leaven. So you can't just like throw it in and bake it. You must, you know, work it in your dough. You must give it a day or so so that you will rise and then you bake your bread. Then you get this nice fluffy bread. So that's what leaven is. Now, this, uh, this process uh, is, just, is a time-consuming process. So we understand, you know, that on that particular night, they were in a rush. They were in a haste. There was no time for the yeast, the sourdough, if you like, to, to do its work. So they had to eat unleavened bread, right? So this is what happens. Uh, it is Exodus chapter 12, verse 33 to 34. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. Be in a hurry. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took the dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls. So the dough was still in the bowls while they are kneading. They haven't even had a chance to work the yeast into uh, add it to the dough yet. The bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. So they ran with the dough. You know, when I looked at the, the movies of this thing, um, when you look at the Prince of Egypt, for instance, cartoon, right? you see them taking the gold of Egypt, but actually, uh, to be historically correct, they should be bringing dough, bowls along with them, wrapped up in their clothes. Right? But I don't see that depicted. But this detail is there. So they were running out of Egypt. It's quite comical. They're all bringing their dough with them. You know, I mean, today, dough we, is another euphemism for money, right? <laughs> they'll bring their money with them. But this, they're literally bringing their dough. And they had to run all the way from Ramesses, the city where they were in, to another city, Sukkot. So Exodus chapter 12, verse 37 to 39 says, Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot besides children and, of course, women. A mixed multitude went up with them, so not just Jews, not just, rather, not just the children of Israel, but also other people who wanted to follow and God accepted them. And flocks and herds a great deal of livestock. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt for it was not leavened. So on their way out, maybe when they reached Sukkot, the other city, they baked this bread. And because they didn't leaven it, they didn't have time to leaven it, they were driven out of Egypt, they could not wait. Um, they ate that day low quality bread. So unleavened bread here is low quality bread. It's not high quality bread. Okay, so that's kind of what this is about. Now, how do Jews today in Israel deal with this commandment? I mean, it's quite difficult because leaven is everywhere. Leaven is in the air also, by the way. You know? I mean, this yeast is, is a kind of fungus. It's everywhere. So how do they do this? Well, the rabbis are very smart, right? Because the commandment says that you shall not have any leaven in your houses. But they say, okay, this law is for... Israelites, right, for Jews. It's not for Gentiles. So here's where we can get some help from the Gentiles. So every feast of unleavened bread on the very first day, all of Israel officially sells all their yeast to a Gentile. Right? For that seven days, all the yeast in Israel does not belong to any Jew. It belongs to a Gentile. You go to the shop, let's say a supermarket provision store, that whole section, they will cover up. You can't buy stuff there because it's not theirs to sell, right? After seven days, they buy back from the Gentiles. So technically speaking, the inspector will come. What's this? Oh, that's not mine. That belongs to that Gentile. So that one Gentile, very powerful. For seven days, he owns all the yeast in Israel. And maybe he decides, you know what? I'm going to cash in on this, right? I mean, they were trying to get away from keeping the commandment or getting, getting away from the legalistic keeping of the commandment. But today we want to ask ourselves, what is the spiritual meaning of this commandment? All right? Not just about legally doing this or that. Why was God telling the children of Israel these things? So three reasons. Right? First of all, it was to remind them that this matter of getting out of Egypt was an urgent matter. It's so urgent that you have to put aside some of the comforts of your life, right? I mean, some of us, you know, sometimes we have to make choices. Should I go to church because it's raining, right? So you've got two decisions now. Rain on the one hand, comforts of life. Going to church on the other hand, a spiritual investment. What would you do? Well, the good news is you're all here, right? It means you all choose church. 
But I suppose today it's not raining. You didn't have to make that decision. Sometimes in our life, we make this decision, right? Do I want to invest in my spiritual life, my walk with God, my, my growth as a Christian, my discipleship, or do I want to invest in the comforts of life? Here, they said, no. If you want to have this leavened bread, then you're not, uh, you're going to have leavened bread, you're not going to leave Egypt. If you want Egypt, you get the leavened bread, but you don't get freedom, right? So that's, this is an urgent, it is an important matter. It is so important that you need to make this decision and not even think about your comforts. That's every time you eat this bread and you're asking, why is this bread so hard? It's because you're doing something more important, right? So first of all, it's urgency. God wants to deliver you. Your deliverance is important to God and to you. Second reason is to remind them of their suffering, where they have come from, right? In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 3, it says, You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction, right? The bread of suffering. The Hebrew word here is the word ani, right? The Lechem ani. So it is the bread of poverty. Ani means poverty. Actually, ani is the, the word from which you get the, the name for some girls, Beth Ani, right? Beth Ani, like my daughter's name. House of Ani. Ani means the house of poverty. That's why I'm very poor, right? House of suffering. I, I suffer a lot also. A house of humility, right? Because you're in a humble state. You're not able to rise up and do anything. That's what Bethany literally means, right? The, the, the town of Bethany, or uh, the house of Bethany, the house of the poor people. Yeah, after this, probably none of you want to name your kids Bethany. Right? But, but this is to remind them that this was your state. You were in this state. You were crying out to God out of your ani, out of your humility, out of your bondage, out of your suffering, out of your misery, out of your you know, st state of desperation. You were calling out to God. Why does God have to remind them, them this thing? Because you know what? Generations will come that forget where they came from. I mean, many of us here uh, look like you're old enough to be, you know, around in the 70s and 80s. You've seen the world as it was a very different time, right? Back in those days, you know, you dial telephone like this one. Today you do this, nobody knows what you're talking about, right? Every time somebody says, hey, why I tell someone, hey, wind up a car window, I tell them, like this, like this. Today, young people will look at me and, what are you doing? Because those days, a car window goes like this one, you see. That's how you wind car windows. Today, they press a button, right? It's a very different time. And they don't realize that they have things so good in their world today. And sometimes, you need to do certain things to remind them, we didn't always have these things. These things are a result of God's blessing on us. We need to remember where we came from and why we cried out to God and why He is our God, our Deliverer. And this is what it is. It is to remind them. That's why it says here, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. All the days, not just one day. Don't be the nine lepers that did not come back to thank Jesus, right? Remember it all the days of your life. That's the second reason. But I think there's a third reason, which I think is arguably more important than these two reasons, right? You notice that the unleavened bread is longer than the Feast of Passover. I'm not entirely sure why, but I've got some theories I want to share with you, right? I think the unleavened bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the Passover goes together. In the Feast of the Passover, the highlight is the blood. The blood of the Lamb does the work, right? You don't have to do anything. You just sit there, hold your breath, and wait for the angel of death to pass over you. You just received it. But in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's a lot of work for you. You have to do something about it. You have to make sure you keep it, not for one day, but for seven days. And I think this is a, a picture of our response to God. Right? That's a response on our part to God. So, in, um, in fact, later in the story, you find that the children of Israel, they were not happy. They were complaining about this. They wanted to actually go back to Egypt. They didn't want to go through what they had to go through. Once they ate, they ate the unleavened bread, they were already starting to complain. They were thinking, you know, this is terrible. We used to have better bread. So in Exodus chapter 14, this is what they, they, uh, they said to Moses. Is it because there were no graves in Egypt 
Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us? Why do you do this to us, right? To bring us up out of Egypt. Is, it, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? You know, we already told you, right? Now you want to put it in our local English context. Saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Wow. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. Sometimes when you try to help people, right? Halfway through, they start complaining against you, even though you're trying to help them. And they're saying, you know what? All the groaning, all the moaning, all the complaining, now oh, forget it. We, we'd rather have that than this. Because, you know, we didn't think our deliverance would look like this. We thought it would be a lot better. In fact, we want our cake and eat it as well. We want to have Egypt and we want to have the promised land. I didn't even realize that having the promised land meant giving up Egypt. So they're saying, ah, oh, you know. Because, you know, Egypt wasn't all bad for them all the time, right? Uh, in the, in the days before the new Pharaoh came along, they had, they had a nice time in Egypt. They prospered. They multiplied. Their businesses were there. They invested. They got married. They had some good memories of Egypt. Now they are thinking of all the good things. They're forgetting all the bad times. Exodus chapter 16, verse 2 and 3. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full leavened bread right, to be sure they ate that to the full but you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger we are starving and they are longing to go back to Egypt not only were they eating uh, unleavened bread they had no meat right so they, they were all upset I think Singaporeans can relate to this Singaporeans are when we, we don't have the kind of food that we like we are sorry. Actually, ironically, whenever I go to Israel, I, I suffer a lot. I don't like the food there. You know, they are, they are eating pita, you know, falafel, all the stuff that I don't eat, too much vegetables, right? Uh, so I bring bakwa, chicken bakwa, right? I bring chicken bakwa. So most of the time in Israel, I'm eating either instant noodles or chicken bakwa, right? I'm thinking like, I want to go back to Singapore, you know? So I think we can relate to this, right? You can understand why they were complaining. But you can see, they were longing their souls for the sourdough, for the old bread. That, that's what they were longing. Their heart reached out. There's a certain familiar. Even though you could say that there was bad for them, the suffering, the making bricks was bad for them, the strange thing is that your heart longs for what is familiar, regardless of whether it's good or bad to, for you. And that's why sometimes we make such bad decisions. We just choose the familiar thing. I mean, just as an example, you know, just in this room here, for those of you who have, you know, been in church before, how many of you are sitting in the same section you usually sit? Maybe even the same chair you always sit. How many of you? See what I mean? Right? So all these people, your creatures have habit. And there's no particular reason why you are choosing that chair. It's not because it's better than their chair. All the chairs are the same, right? They all have been out hosted. They all pretty much feel the same. Maybe you say, but this one's got my bum shape, right? I already sat there for long enough in church. But you know what? Sometimes we do the same thing with our old men, our old Christian life, our own non-Christian life. We yearn for that. Oh, yeah, before I was Christian, I used to be able to do this, you know. I used to be able to go out and hang out with all my buddies and go to uh, karaoke, go to KDV, do all these other things. Now, now I cannot. Now I've got to go cell group, you know. So sometimes there's a part of us that's unwilling to relinquish Egypt. And that's why some people used to say, you know, it's one thing to take people out of Egypt. It's another thing altogether to take Egypt out of them. And I think this is what this Feast of Unleavened Bread is about. It's about taking the leaven out of you, right? Taking the leaven out taking the Egypt out of us. And I think the leaven here represents all that, I suppose, to use a metaphor of another metaphor, all that Egypt represents. And Egypt, of course, represents your old life. And God wants you to come out. So, really, there are three things that we can talk about. This. First of all, we learn that freedom comes with a cost. You can't always have your cake and eat it as well. You want deliverance. You want freedom. You want God to save you. Yes, God will do it, but at a cost. And the cost is you have to leave Egypt. You can't have that 
And, and for many of us, it is a long process, right? It is the second thing, right? This is a long process. It's not something that happens overnight. That's why that feast of Passover is longer. Yeah, deliverance, just one day. But your, you know, getting you out of Egypt, that's one day. But getting Egypt out of you, that's seven days. That's going to take the rest of our lives. And today, many of us, we are still struggling to get Egypt out of us, to get the leaven out of our lives. The third thing is that there are some things you just can't take with you out of Egypt, right? For some of us, it may be your old habits, your old ways of thinking, your old opinions and your old worldviews, your attitudes. These things you can't take with you into the promised land. You got to leave them behind at some point, right? And sometimes some of us are bogged with these things and preventing us from stepping out to the front. I'm running out of time, so I'm going a little bit quicker, right? So, what are you supposed to do on the very first day of the Passover, uh, of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which also happens to be the Passover night? What was it that the Bible says you must do? First day, you must search for all the leaven in your house. That's what you're supposed to do, right? So, every year, during that one week, the first week, the first day of that week, you would search for all the leaven. Now, this is what I was saying before. They will sell all the leaven to Gentiles. I want to suggest to you that spiritually, you can't do that. Uh, for, for this one week, I'll sell all my sins and all my bad habits to, I don't know, Pastor Chris or Pastor Daniel Tew or whatever. Like, let him deal with it. Then after the week's over, I'll buy it all back. Yay, you know. Uh, that's not how you keep it, right? I think the way we keep it, and although we are a week late, not too late, I think we do it by introspecting. We look at our own lives. Review your own lives and ask yourself, what is the leaven in your life? So if you want to keep it today, today is the day that you look, take a bit of time, pause from you know, the hustle and bustle of life, pause from your busyness of life, stop, to look in your life and ask yourself, what are the things you need to leave in Egypt? What are the things God wants you to leave behind? Because you can't take this thing along and still make it. This thing is going to bog you down. Anyway, it's like, God has cut the chain, but you're still carrying the, the chain around with you. That's not going to help you very much, all right? Although you're no longer bound, but you're still carrying this weight that weighs you down. Some of you, maybe there are things that God wants you to do, right? So what are some of these things that uh, you, you cannot bring with you? Think about this today as we do this. What is our Egypt? What are these things that enslave us? There has power over our choices and our decisions. Some of you have, you know, you really like certain things, certain hobbies, certain habits, and even certain vices in your life. These things control you. Well, I want you to know, in keeping the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, you are reflecting and you're saying, no, this, this has to go. My bad temper, that has to go. Oh, my gossiping mouth, that has to go. All this leaven, they need to be left behind. God, would you help me? in these seven days to, to just get rid of this thing. You follow what I'm saying? Uh, this week, uh, this is what we are doing. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus called the people to himself. He said to the disciples, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. This self-denial. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and gospel's sake, will save it. Right? So this is the process of self-denial. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is about us denying ourselves. Second thing you can think about, I suppose, is you have to kind of think about what you want to leave behind. I suppose we, just, we kind of talked about it just now. Right? Because it will cost you something. Faith and the walk with God will cost you. What is your cross? You know, what is the thing that you have to pay in order to, to follow God out of Egypt? I'm close with this word of encouragement from uh, Leviticus 26, verse 13. Because we're thinking of all these things that God wants to help us. The process of helping, the medicine for our souls is sometimes unpleasant. You know, sometimes you eat medicine, oh, yeah, it tastes terrible. But look, that's what it takes. And if that's what it takes, that's what you have to go through, right? So, so we look at this and we think, this is so terrible, all this mess, and no wonder they were complaining all the time and complaining non-stop. But I want you to remember this, even as you're going through this 
I guess, seven days of unleavened bread. Leviticus chapter 26, 13 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. God's desire is so that you are not enslaved by these things. These things that we talked about, they enslave you. Your bad habits, they enslave you. Our vices, whether it's envy, jealousy, insecurity, these things enslave you. It make you a slave. And God says, I don't want you to be a slave because God wants for you freedom. God wants you to enjoy the life He's given for you. God wants you to experience His purpose, His destiny for you. So you're not supposed to be a slave. And God says, you should not be their slaves. I've broken the bands of your yoke that you may walk upright and not bent over with the weight of sin in your life. So today, even as we come to the end of this and before we celebrate the Holy Communion, the bread and the wine, right? The wine and the bread. I hope that we can take a moment now to think about this, right? Just close your eyes for a moment. as we Maybe allow God to speak to you about the leaven in your life, right? First day, let's search out the leaven and say to the Lord, this one, help me to put this aside. Help me to have that unleavened bread, as it were, remembering where you delivered us from. Lord, we thank you for this uh, feast in the Bible that reminds us of the journey that we make to you, Lord. Today, even as we hear these words, may you also give us the self-awareness, eyes that see and recognize clearly the work you wish to still do in each one of our lives. Some of us here today may be struggling in a great struggle with some sin, something. Father, I pray that you will make their hearts tender so that they don't have to wait until all the ten plagues before they cave in, but they will quickly turn back to you. In the name of Jesus, we ask and we pray. Amen.